My name is Ellen Watts. Um, I'm a principal and co-founder of a firm called Architera. I'm here this morning with my partner, Dan Ahrens. He and I started the firm a little over a decade ago. And I personally am delighted to be here. Normally on a Saturday morning, I'm suffering through an advanced yoga class that's way beyond my skill level. Best thing about it is over by 10.30, so I'm very happy to be here. I live in the uh, town of Wellesley, not too far from here. And unlike Lexington, we've been way behind the pack until recently uh, when the firm established its first carbon footprint baseline and established some standards which is now happily succeeding with the helpful advice of neighboring communities like Lexington and Arlington where Dan lives and Cambridge which always seems to be out in front. Um, we'd like to share um, a little bit of our work. We've been continuously energy modeling and designing non-residential commercial and institutional buildings for over 15 years. And we've chosen just four of them to highlight what Mark might say are opportunities to think about in a forward-leaning way for your next round of structures. We deliberately have focused our practice on regional projects and on those that are not residential, even though we acknowledge that there are twice as many residential square feet as there are non-residential square feet in the state of Massachusetts, uh, non-residential projects tend to be a good deal bigger. And in fact, you've just realized with Mark's introduction that uh, just three or four buildings might constitute 30% of your town's energy demand. So that's where we put our muscle. And before I give you the preview about um, these four projects, just quick uh, snapshot case studies. I'd like to tell you some of our biases. We think LEED is great. It is a terrific way to stretch one's mind across all of the categories that ultimately build to human health, comfort, and productivity. However, LEED is not enough. Uh, until 2009, there were no energy prerequisites at all. You could get LEED points for energy, but you didn't have to. And now there is a prerequisite, but it is only half that that the Massachusetts stretch code requires. So LEED is not enough. Our second bias is that, based on Dan's and my experience and Arcaterra's uh, portfolio as a whole, we have through 24 high performance buildings across a very wide range of project types shown that it is possible to design buildings at about half of what the code requires us to. And that is for all kinds of project types. And we can lock in that good performance through some things that don't cost any more at all, through the decision about siting the building relative to solar access, massing the building, often controlling the available area for solar collection, insulating, or we call it outsulating, to get across the principle of no thermal breaks to the uh, structure. Um, strategic thinking about windows. As a society, we tend to use too much glass in our contemporary buildings without enough thought about the true benefit of daylight and the way in which the um, different uh, orientation of those windows benefits or hinders the insulated envelope. And last, uh, high performance um, mechanical and electrical systems uh, which should often be reduced, just as Mark explained, but can only be if they're part of an integrated design philosophy. Um, our next bias is that we can do all this uh, across a wide range of project types for conventional budgets. Every one of these four projects I'm going to show, we were hired alongside of other firms, alongside of a client group that had only so much money to spend. Some of these are public clients, some of these are private clients, but everybody has a budget, let me assure you. Nobody comes open pocketbook and says, sky's the limit, design a, an advanced high performance building. Um, these buildings all range in cost per square foot between three and four hundred dollars. They were what they were going to spend to begin with, not adjusted for uh, adjusted upwards for some um, high performance aspiration that came late. Um, and lastly, um, I think you'll see through these four examples that we believe green buildings can look any way you want them to look. We've built buildings of red brick, of a gray stone, of white metal, of um, 
beautiful natural finished wood, uh, just about sl locally uh, sourced slate, just about anything you could think of. Green buildings can look any way you want them to, and they can be designed to be truly uh, stunningly gorgeous. So with that, let me just briefly introduce our firm. We're located down on Long Wharf, or a studio-sized practice of 15 people. Uh, we are in a building that was originally built as a warehouse. It's the uh, custom house block. Um, this is half of our office. It's wide open. It's very collaborative, open culture. There are no walls. And that it indeed promotes the sort of integrated design philosophy that we have. Um, one of our uh, hallmarks is that every one of our staff members is lead accredited. Uh, we also have as a hallmark that we are very active in public policy discussions as well as in design research uh, through our work. Just passed our 10th year anniversary and uh, completed our 24th project. The four projects we're going to offer is quick snapshot case studies today. Um, three of them are in Massachusetts and one of them is in upstate New York. The three in Massachusetts are Clark University in Worcester, uh, the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife in Westboro, and the Cambridge School of Weston in Weston, so none of them very far from here. And the one in upstate New York is in Syracuse. Um, Paul, in his leadership with uh, the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association, has uh, set a marvelous standard for capturing lots and lots of data. Uh, so we have done just this for um, the four projects that we're going to uh, highlight today, as well as three others on this table. And in particular, what we'd like you to notice is the column over on the right, which says percent renewable energy. So the first two projects, which I'll talk about, the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife uh, field headquarters in Westboro, Mass, and the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York, are uh, zero net energy and energy plus buildings. That is, they're generating more energy than they are uh, estimated to use annually. Um, I should qualify that this is an estimate. The Division of Fisheries and Wildlife Project, as you'll see, is under construction. It's to be completed towards the end of this summer. And the ESF project has just opened, and so is just collecting its first few months of operating data. Uh, then Dan will talk about the project we have under design for Clark University, which is also targeted as a zero net energy building. And our Cambridge School of Weston project was designed uh, to be about half uh, towards the target of zero net energy. Another important thing to say is while we specialize in advanced high-performance buildings of a wide range of project types, we've also become adept at the particular renewable energy systems opportunities that each and every client brings to us. Some clients are campuses that are already mostly or completely powered by wind. Uh, others have great solar access. Others are urban and have uh, compromised solar access, but an opportunity regionally for locally sourced biomass. So all of the systems that we're going to be talking about integrating into the design of these non-residential buildings range from biomass, ground source and air source heat, source heat pumps, uh, solar photovoltaics, uh, solar thermal wind, and biomass cogen. Um, even more of the particulars of the data uh, are shown on this chart. I'd emphasize the bottom line, which is the construction cost. Most of our projects cost between 10 and $20 million. And as I mentioned, I have an average cost somewhere between $300 and $400 a square foot. Far more potent a factor than what kind of renewable energy system does it have, or what kind of envelope does it have, and what does the building look like, uh, are often the parameters of site improvements. Uh, some of these sites are very challenging rocky sites with uh, 10,000 cubic yards of excavate to be removed, even to make ready a site, and that uh, far and away uh, wags the cost. These projects are also sometimes advantaged, but not always, by subsidies, rebates, and grants. And that's another factor that makes it somewhat more difficult to compare apples to apples when talking about these projects. Um, 
Each one of our projects begins with intensive energy modeling in the conceptual design phase when we have multiple options of how to site the building, how to mass the building, and even what's in the building. And I should say that uh, even though we are architects respectful of owners' needs, one of our greatest challenges to our owners is to ask, do you really need to build this uh, amount of square footage and to try to make multiple uh, spaces serve um, you know, multiple functions. So each one of the buildings is initially understood in conceptual design as a relative heating or cooling load, which one is going to dominate, and what are the expectations for the um, unexpected loads. Lab buildings will have great big um, uh, plug loads for equipment. Um, sometimes academic buildings have campus server rooms in them, which can dominate. Uh, and we always want to try to understand where are the energy hogs and how can we mitigate those if we can mitigate those. Uh, in the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, for example, this is principally an office building for 120 people. So you could imagine this as a municipal office building. Take a look at the green uh, pie wedge, which is 36%. Those are all of the computers, copiers, printers, and office equipment for the uh, Department of Fish and Game to operate uh, their programs. Can't do without those, but we certainly can uh, get the cooperation and buy-in of the users not to uh, overdo the miscellaneous equipment load with standalone printers, uh, mini fridges under the desk, space heaters, we don't want those, uh, to try to limit that. Um, here's a quick snapshot of uh, ESF. Uh, you can see there, uh, there's quite a large space cooling load, uh, even in Syracuse, New York. And what's important about this is, this was a building that's a campus center, and it has lots of assembly spaces uh, which require cooling, uh, as might a high school, as might a municipal building with a hall like this. And when we know we have a cooling load, we know we have to pay extra attention to all the things that could mitigate uh, that cooling demand, including exterior solar shading and massing of the building uh, to mitigate that. So you can see by, by peeking into each one of these uh, pie charts, we can see in advance, before we commit to a concept design, what are the proportionate loads and by the relative heating and cooling demand, we can also know best what kind of a system uh, mechanically and electrically to aim for. Uh, here you can see um, Cambridge School of Weston. You're all saying, why is there such a large heating load? Uh, this is a building that was driving towards a, a very, very advanced um, passive solar design concept and was not going to have any cooling. So on a relative basis, the heating load was very large. And that made us put even more emphasis into the, the envelope. So once we do uh, have a preliminary understanding of the uh, expected energy loads, we do analyze options, and then we proceed with a design. And here's our first case study. This is the uh, principally an office building, field headquarters for the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, what we had as a challenge here was to create a form that was optimally solar tuned, but also spread out enough across uh, wings that are variously two and three stories to accommodate that optimally sloped solar PV array to gain enough collection area for solar to power the building entirely. We also were at pains to feature a view which is principally in the direction of this rendering, but that is also to the north, where typically we would want only about 10% of the exterior envelope to be windowed. We had some major assembly spaces where we did want large amounts of glass, but you can see this glass is self-shaded by the wings that are paired around it. So this is always a conundrum, how to site a building. And again, this, as Mark said, is something like paint color. It comes for free. You're going to build a building, which way to site it? Here the challenge was balancing uh, what we had hoped would be uh, an optimal south orientation with views to the north and east. 
And here is the selected concept design. Uh, there's a two acre native plant landscape uh, outside the building that runs within the building and a live trout pond featuring all the mission and educational purpose of this agency. These are some of the native plants. And again, uh, energy considerations uh, apart, uh, the lead guidelines are being very well met. This will be uh, ultimately a lead platinum certified building. Uh, this is some of the original interior modeling. Uh, well, many of the offices uh, have uh, exterior views, they also have a light source from the interior, which is top lit. We broke some new ground here by one of the first commercial and institutional applications of insulated structural panels, which are typically made for the residential market. And here you can see the careful computation and tallying excuse me, tallying of glazed areas. Um, we are ve very fastidious about putting glazing where it counts. It not only costs more than a solid wall, but the very best window is only um, half as good as the worst wall, so in terms of insulating value. So we want to be very judicious about glazing. And this is a little bit of a sectional uh, diagram to give you the sense of how important top lighting was again, in a very strategic way to that interior space. Many of the offices uh, need to be clustered in groups of uh, 15 to 25, depending upon the uh, department, and they, everybody sits together in an open office environment. Uh, any solar photovoltaic system is going to involve then a lot of strategic planning about where to put uh, the whatnots, uh, I call them. The whatnots meaning um, PV inverters, uh, electrical kill switches for uh, fire uh, fighting and the like. Uh, and here you can see uh, some of the attention to those details in the, in the sectional details I'm showing now. We also know that um, the best way to eliminate a heating load is to not let more daylight into the building than is necessary for daylighting. So where we do have a desire for a large expanse of glass, usually for an assembly purpose, we are very caring about the exterior solar shading that bounces the light um, uh, away from the building, uh, except in the winter when we want to have it admitted for passive solar gain. We use a lot of uh, three-dimensional modeling in our work that allows us simultaneously to coordinate our systems with all the engineering systems and produces a continuous stream of rendering so everybody can understand not only the details but how will this look. Um, aesthetics never being completely absent from anybody's consideration. Uh, here you see the Revit model and here you see the space last week under construction. You get a sense that's not quite ready for occupancy but it should be in about four months. Uh, here are those uh, simple, very inexpensive acrylic skylights that are lined within by light diffusing um, acrylic uh, rims. We call them luminaires that amplify the daylight. Uh, here you see the standing seam metal roof, which does double duty as support for the PV panels that just simply clip on rails to it. So it's very adaptable. We know solar technology is changing very fast. In a few years, um, they may be switched out for more efficient panels. Here you can see on the left those things that look like uh, a row of uh, electrical panels. Those are on the exterior wall. Those are the inverters for the PV panels. They're organized in uh, a nice part of the roof here, which is not uh, principally visible from the interior offices, and yet it's exterior uh, walkable, so you can go and visit the skylights and the fans and the um, uh, inverters to see how the whole building works. And here are a couple more details to show how the exterior shading and the rain screen facade uh, work. These uh, glass exterior shades are fritted uh, for just the optimal uh, translucency, but also so that we get the uh, daylight well bounced away from the building. And there's one final view of the exterior. Uh, the final grading is being prepared now for that uh, beautiful native plant garden to be going in. The second project is uh, the farthest away in a climate that's even more um, heating 
requiring than uh, anywhere in Massachusetts. It's in Syracuse, New York. This is the campus center, as I mentioned, which is principally assembly and office use uh, for the College of uh, Environmental Science and Forestry at SUNY ESF, commonly called ESF. This is a school founded as a forestry school by Teddy Roosevelt and a bunch of other conservationists about 100 years ago. And one of our uh, struggles with this building is we had a wonderful site, it was a parking lot, um, which had great views east and west, but unfortunately, a, a very broad exposure due west, as you can see here. So west was where the views were, but west was also where we didn't want the sun to come from. So it was really a challenge of how to mask the building. We didn't have a choice about siting it. Couldn't twist it around at all. That red square or rectangle was what it was. So we had to figure out a way to make a form that converted west exposure to south exposure. And we did that through uh, the crenellation of the wall. We made angled walls or serrated walls, as you can see here by the floor plans. And how that appears then uh, these walls look, we call them flipper walls, as though they move, but they don't. They're stationary, but what they do is they block the west. Uh, there is a little gun slit window to the west, but they make all those western uh, wall areas into south glazing. So we get the best of both worlds. We get the insulated uh, west wall panel with a little view, and where we uh, have the serrations uh, turned south, we get a nice full uh, south window. Where we have uh, large areas of glass in this building, those are double glazed facades, so there's an extra air cavity uh, between uh, curtain wall and the interior glazing. Um, all of the operable sash, these are awning windows, are uh, motorized to operate through a centralized building uh, management control system. So diurnally, the windows open and close depending upon the outside temperature, again, mitigating the need for any cooling uh, in the building. Um, here were some of our studies to show how we could integrate those flipper walls with a couple of other important aspects of the building, one of which is that on the lowest roof, we have a 10,000 square foot intensive green roof. This is intensive, meaning planting depths on the roof of up to two feet. And that was principally to showcase the uh, conservation landscape architecture program at the college. None of these buildings could be realized without a fabulous design team. In addition to Arcaterra, we have at least a dozen engineers and consultants, and we're also in very close partnership with our contractors on these projects, who in this case performed lots of mock-ups and um, smoke testing for air infiltration. And we did even more intensive testing of the windows on this project, given their importance for the uh, thermal barrier. And we found that um, on first test, they failed. On second test, they failed. So we tried a third time, and that was a charm. Uh, but it's just emphasizing the importance of testing on these projects, because the design is only as good as it can be built. And if we don't go through the rigorous testing in the field, we may not achieve our results. Now, the energy story on this project I haven't yet fully revealed because within this building is a district renewable energy plant. And we have asked ourselves, since starting the design of this project four years ago, and it's now just been opened, why aren't all campuses like this? Why aren't all town centers like this? Why aren't many neighborhoods like this? Come to find out, in Europe, they are. Um, and to be specific about it, the district energy plant that is on the lower level of this building uh, produces energy not only for this gateway center, uh, but for the four adjacent buildings, a library and three academic buildings, two of which are research labs, so very energy intensive. So this little powerhouse is powerful. It provides 60% of the campus's heating needs in Syracuse, New York, and 20% of its electrical needs through a variety of uh, fuels, the principal one of which is biomass. And the uh, further um, headline about this project is, in the moment it came online a few months ago, it stepped the carbon footprint of this campus down by 25 percent. 
and the energy cost down by 60 percent uh, because it's not only weaning itself off of fossil fuels, but is weaning itself off of very high premium costs for power transmitted through the adjacent Syracuse University, private university um, uh, plant systems. So it's a very, very positive investment story. A lot of people say, well, yeah, but what did that power plant cost? It was about a, a $22 million project. The plant itself cost about $2.5 million. Uh, had it been sized for the building alone, uh, it would have cost less. But the net present value investment return over 15 years for upsizing it for all these adjoining buildings was about $2 million. So it was a very, very beneficial investment. And I think we are turning a corner as a society um, from thinking about green technologies as added cost to being shrewd investments. And most of our clients who are leading uh, the demand for green buildings are some of the smartest people financially we know. So that's just something that we have noticed in our work. Uh, the photovoltaic uh, capacity of this project, um, and this is about a 120 kilowatt array, is on the upper roof. These are high output uh, sun power panels. Um, needed to be considered alongside of where are we going to find space for a pellet bunker in this building. Here you can see where it is next to that power plant. And diagrammatically, here's how the wood pellet system works. It's a cogeneration system, so it's producing both heat and power. And we get into some pretty funky things to have to figure out. You know, how often are we going to be getting pellet truck deliveries? How can that delivery be provided for? Uh, and even what are the access ways for trucks of various society, uh, capacities? And principally, we do work for academic institutions. A question we're always asking is not only how can we uh, heat uh, these buildings, make them energy efficient, but how can we then teach with these systems? How can we make these self-propelling of a next generation of high-performance buildings? These are some of the things we think about. Uh, making that combined heating and power plant on the lower level completely visible to students, having, of course, a lot of educational display um, in the lobby as well as that lower level, and making the materials themselves uh, especially uh, signifying of, uh, in this case, FSC certified wood. Uh, there's a lot of stone-like recycled uh, porcelain tile, um, and daylighting is also often very expressive in our buildings. Since this was a forestry school, we used more than the normal amount of wood, uh, and in fact uh, featured about uh, eight different species within the building and two more outside the building. Uh, the green roof is part of a very beautiful uh, rainwater management system that we designed in collaboration with Andropogon of Philadelphia is also uh, a very important research and teaching tool, this green roof and the rainwater gardens on either side of the building. There you can see the relationship of the mid-level roof with the upper photovoltaic roof uh, in this little sectional drawing. And here are examples of some of the planting. The planting established two regional endangered uh, native plant communities. There's an alv alvar grasslands community and there's a dune community of plants. And this just to give you the final idea of what the building is principally used for. This is one of the three conference uh, facilities. Uh, there's also a bookstore and a cafe, uh, as well as a concourse for public gatherings, which is a, a home for the Theodore Roosevelt Wildlife Collection. And the entire upper level are offices, as you might have municipal offices or school offices in your town. So two more case studies of local interest. So our third case study is uh, this building uh, for Clark University uh, in Worcester. It's the uh, LEAP Center, which is the Liberal Education and Effective Practice Center, uh, which is a place uh, for students to learn about uh, externships, internships, and other uh, opportunities um, that they can augment their education with. 
Uh, Clark is a very innovative institution and um, likes to involve their students in research. They uh, also developed one of the first uh, lead uh, buildings in the state, which is actually a, a science building and the first uh, science lab to uh, be lead certified at, at the gold level. Uh, this building is uh, a special building for them because it's um, going to be expanding their, their campus across uh, this main street. You can see here the uh, campus on the north side of uh, Main Street uh, in an area of uh, a town, if you don't know Worcester, called South Main, which is a bit down at, at the heels. And so Clark is, uh, is a gem at this end of Main Street. Uh, and they are uh, expanding across the way uh, to a site which is on access with their 100-year-old uh, uh, center of campus building. Uh, and the, the building, which uh, is termed Alumni and Student Engagement Center, you can see uh, here at the south side of the axis. And it's set in a greenway. So this is a, an opportunity uh, for the building to stitch together uh, across Main Street, a, a beautiful green uh, quadrangled campus with University Park, which is uh, down uh, to the uh, left there. Uh, creating an environment that connects people uh, to green spaces within an urban context. And here you see a, a, a close-up of uh, the LEAP Center, uh, which features uh, a four-story uh, uh, building, it's about 40,000 square feet, with a parking structure uh, to the right, which is uh, there to house about 120 spaces and which allows people who are arriving to campus to immediately then enter the pedestrian environment uh, and connect with uh, the building, the greenway, and, and the campus. Uh, you can see that the, the building's not quite on a, uh, an east-west axis. It's pretty good, um, but has uh, its primary uh, role of relating to uh, the campus structure. Uh, and here you see uh, in the, the uh, orange the first floor plan and how that relates uh, to the main axis of campus going to the north through a pedestrian uh, park uh, or, or plaza uh, across the main axis. Uh, the first level has this uh, LEAP Center, uh, and it's a place for students to cross Main Street and to learn, again, about these opportunities. So there's uh, a public space uh, in, shown in yellow uh, which connects to the outside. It's very well daylit uh, and becomes a gathering place for students to learn about their opportunities. Uh, and then there are support spaces and conferencing uh, in the center of the, of the uh, floor plan with a bookstore, again, to draw students across Main Street uh, to engage in this side of the campus. And above, uh, an alumni uh, and student engagement center uh, allowing people to come together here uh, and uh, then offices. And, what you'll see is a, a narrow footprint that allows all of the spaces to be uh, well daylit with great views and uh, areas that don't need as much light like the um, men's and women's room and uh, transitory spaces like uh, the, the print copy room uh, put in the center along with stairs so that you really can come out uh, to the perimeter of the building. And above, uh, administrative offices and some more um, public spaces including classrooms that overlook those other public spaces at um, the southwest. Uh, and finally the, the, the fourth level some, some more um, offices and building systems. Now there are a lot of things that go into this and, and all of our green buildings. Um, 
I'm not going to read down the list, but you'll see a combination of building systems, uh, building materials, some of the things that, that, that Paul was talking about from uh, heat pumps to recycled content materials. But all of these things cannot just be sort of thrown together and specified and made to be a green building. They need to be well integrated. And so that involves early thinking, early uh, goal setting, and metrics that um, weave these things together into uh, not just a, a building with green features, but a green building that is high performance and works well. Um, the, the goal of energy efficiency is to first drive down uh, the energy loads of the building, use less energy, and then uh, to try to use that uh, renewable energy that you can. Uh, and Ellen showed a, a, a matrix of all of the various types of of renewable energy, and each project might find uh, a different one important. Uh, here we were looking at uh, renewable energy by photovoltaics, and uh, this is uh, an earlier study that said, what if we use photovoltaics and we have a pitched roof on the building? Uh, what can we do to satisfy even a low uh, energy building? Well, we found that the roof could satisfy 34% of the energy load of the building. Uh, and putting a parking, uh, a parking canopy uh, PV array could then satisfy the rest of, of the load. Uh, but it would require covering that entire canopy. And the university would like this to be a zero net energy building. It wants to supply all of its energy on site. And the more that they can do on the building itself, the better. And we looked at uh, the possibility of a rooftop canopy, one uh, which covers the entire roof. Instead of a, a gabled roof, a flat canopy above a building. And here we were able to satisfy half of the energy of the, of the four-story uh, building uh, with the photovoltaics, and then could have a smaller uh, well, equal-sized uh, array on the, on the parking. Now, you can't just throw technology at, at the building. Uh, you really need to design this. It needs to be beautiful. It needs to be well-liked. Uh, if we just throw up a, a, an ugly array, then it's not going to be well-liked, uh, even if you can get it built. And so we looked at how does the PV array integrate into this uh, urban environment. It, there's a neighboring uh, church you see to the left, um, and then this uh, campus building, and how could that uh, uh, PV array fit in well? And you can see the, the thin line floating above the building, which is the, the photovoltaics that will make half of the building's energy. And uh, here you see looking uh, up Main Street with the campus on the left, uh, and the uh, proposed building on the right, uh, again, how, how does that fit in terms of scale? So that's, that's part of the uh, design, uh, an urban design challenge. Uh, when you enter this building, you will have uh, not only a lot of information, but a wonderful social environment that's well daylit, that connects to the outdoors and back to campus. Uh, and this is uh, that first first floor space that connects also with an upper level uh, for the um, engagement center. And here from above, looking down uh, to um, the Leap Center and beyond to the plaza and the Greenway. Uh, so you're really connected uh, between the urban environment and the architectural environment. The building, uh, you'll notice, has a lot of structure that is on the outside. It has columns that hold up the array. Uh, it has um, the, the curtain wall. And one of the detail jobs that we need to do uh, is to make sure that the thermal envelope works really well on these buildings to drive those loads down. And uh, about 15 years ago, there was a presentation that had a building that had a 
a big cantilever, and that was the downfall of the energy story of that building because uh, it's really difficult to insulate. Insulation is always sort of fl soft, fluffy stuff that has uh, air in it, and it's hard to have that be a structural component of your building. Um, and so the, the answer then was just don't do anything. Build a box, and, and your best building is going to be a refrigerator, right? You should, all buildings should look like refrigerators. This was an energy uh, guru's point of view. Well, the miracle of modern science, um, if you look at the, some of the, the sort of sketchy details here around, we look at where we have structure and uh, the dark, the, the reddish areas are places where structure goes from the inside of the building to the outside. And there we're using, you know, space age, structural material that is also insulating. And so we're able now to continue the thermal envelope. It's not used commonly, but uh, much to our delight, our structural engineers have embraced it. This is material that's used not for insulating, but for isolation in bridges and other uh, structures. And so they're familiar with it, uh, but not in this context. And so we're bringing in other, other materials to be able to make some of the architectural expression um, that is also energy efficient. And the result is that you can have uh, these nice combination of materials, um, elegant support of photovoltaic arrays, connections to campus that aren't connecting you just to a, re a refrigerator shaped building. And here's a, here's a view that shows how the building is also connected to that, that greenway. So the, uh, the fourth example uh, that I'd like to share with you is actually the earliest example. And this is uh, the Garthwaite Center for Science and Art at the Cambridge School of Weston. Uh, it's about 12 minutes from here. Um, and uh, this is a high school science and art building. Uh, the idea was to have an interdisciplinary uh, uh, building where you could learn uh, science through art, art through science, and, and have um, an interesting exploration of both. Uh, it, they wanted a building that teaches, and they wanted a, um, a building that would perform well, and they came to us with uh, about a dozen pages of metrics and requirements, um, all but one of them had to do with sustainability. How much water should you use? How much energy can you use? Um, what the materials could be? Uh, what kind of daylight should you have? How many uh, watts per square foot of lighting could you install? It was incredible and wonderful. Uh, and so, uh, this, this building uh, was occupied in 2008. Uh, it was very advanced uh, when it opened, uh, and we've been tracking it and want to share with you both the successes and some of the challenges because uh, you learn from these, um, these experiences. So uh, this is the, the main facade of the building uh, facing south. Its um, main feature is a, a canopy which uh, is designed to allow sunlight deep into the building during the winter, but to block it during the summer. And as Ellen said, the goal was to have uh, no air conditioning. In the end, there are three spaces in the building that are air conditioned for very specific reasons, and, and I'll share that with you. Um, if you go around this building to the right, to the east, you'll see uh, a building uh, that looks a little bit different. This is the side where the classrooms are. Uh, the light comes in uh, in the morning, deep into the classrooms, allowing uh, teachers to teach without lights on. Uh, and the, the window apertures are, uh, you can see, are, are designed. The high ones allow light deep into the space. The lower ones light the spaces near the walls and let you see out. You'll also see two other things. One is this uh, curious tin man uh, to the right side of the building. That's a wood pellet boiler uh, that uh, the use of uh, wood was projected to reduce carbon uh, 
uh, emissions and fossil fuel use by 60% compared to a baseline building. Uh, and then you'll also see the uh, building slopes to the south, and that's uh, a roof that is uh, sloped ready to take photovoltaics that um, the school could not afford to put in when they put the building there, but have since uh, been able to do. And uh, this has a similar contribution uh, to their uh, their carbon footprint as the as the um, wood pellet boiler. The uh, space in the center of the building between art and uh, science classrooms uh, is an open space. When people walk into this space, um, Mark was talking about air quality, when people walk into this space, the first thing they do is stop and they take a deep breath and they go, there's something different here. The materials haven't been off-gassing, they're selected um, for the air quality impact as well as the renewable uh, resource impact and the, the building is naturally ventilated as well as having entirely fresh air brought in. So if the concern is if you're doing energy efficient uh, building, you're going to create an, uh, an airtight envelope and I'm not going to be able to breathe in the building, don't worry. You're going to be able to open it up and even during the winter you're going to bring in all fresh air. Um, what we learned about this, this building was that it is used a whole lot more than expected. So while we start uh, early with energy modeling, those en energy models are uh, uh, predicated on certain assumptions that our clients make about how much they are going to use the building. And this building uh, has been used so much more uh, than they, they expected. They expected to use um, a public meeting space uh, a few times a, a semester, and they're using it a few times a week because it's a wonderful space that uh, everybody is trying to book. So that's going to throw off how much energy you use because you're, you're using that space so much. Uh, the edu educational benefit they've gotten is terrific. Here you see students in a, a gallery, an informal learning space that's also adjacent on the left to a room that houses the composters for their composting toilets. This building is not connected to uh, either storm or wastewater uh, piping. It's entirely standalone. To the right, you can see the wood pellet uh, boiler room. Uh, and, and at the bottom, you can see a series of 10 uh, very simple signs that were posted around the, the building uh, that explain all different aspects of the building so that students walking through with a little free time can learn about the sustainable nature of the building. I mentioned the, uh, the, that south canopy and the passive nature of it. Here you can see uh, how light on, on the left, light comes deep into the space uh, during the winter, but is stopped during the summer. And this means that the, the main part of the building doesn't need to be cooled uh, during the summer. It stays cool through uh, thermal mass and natural ventilation. In part, uh, the the he heating uh, story and energy use has been successful because of a terrific building envelope that was well designed and then well constructed and tested to make sure that it was working well. Uh, thick insulation, triple uh, pane windows um, that have, have worked terrifically well. Uh, less successful has been the wood pellet boiler um, because there's an educational aspect that goes along with a new technology. Not that it's complicated, but the requ it, it requires a certain amount of engagement with a new technology to make sure you use it right. And there was a transition in uh, the operation of the facilities between the design and the, and the um, you know, use and, and operation of the building. And some of the information didn't get passed along. And as well, uh, the the school decided not to commission their, their building, which means that even when it was 
built well and turned over, there wasn't a really rigorous look at making sure that all the systems worked, how they were designed, uh, and in all aspects of you know, different conditions, uh, winter, summer conditions, and so forth. So they didn't get off to a, a great start in that way. Uh, one thing that has been successful is that this building is uh, generally not air conditioned, but is comfortable even in um, you know, the, the heat of summer. Uh, but a couple of spaces, the ones that are used so much are air conditioned, and therefore some of the energy has, um, has uh, been used more. Um, the building is home to the first uh, LED lighting uh, that was installed in an institutional building. We looked at, at the time, you know, conventional uh, display lighting compared to LED lighting. Uh, we realized that the conventional lighting burns hot, uses a lot of electricity, uh, and doesn't last so long, whereas the LEDs uh, have a much greater uh, lamp life and have a, a savings uh, over, over time. But much as uh, Paul was saying, uh, not only do you, know, you get savings because energy costs are going to be rising, but also because we were able to save in uh, the cooling that was installed. Um, now, the lighting was sort of first generation. Uh, it was warrantied, and they, were, uh, they needed to use that warranty after not too long. But they've been uh, up and running again with some improved lighting um, since then. Ellen mentioned, uh, don't build more than you need to. Uh, don't you know, put a lot of expense into building two rooms that are similar uh, when you could be using them uh, in one room in, at different times in different ways. So this is uh, their multi-purpose room. Uh, it is used for meetings, for lecture, as well as every five weeks an all-school uh, art exhibit uh, where there are panels that roll out from the wall. Um, this is showing sort of both uses at the same time, um, but they roll out from the wall to get as much surface area for art exhibit as possible. And that's worked really well. On the other hand, the, the, the room is difficult in terms of acoustics because it's got a hard surface uh, and you know, it, it, it's hard sometimes to make a, a room work you know, for multiple purposes. So you have to really carefully look at what, what do you want to do with that, um, that space. But here you see uh, at the top the, the gallery mode as an art exhibit and at the bottom, the sort of event mode uh, showing for a, a talk or a lecture. Uh, but they've been very happy with the building. Uh, at, the, at the beginning, uh, we've, Ellen showed we've been tracking the energy use, and um, it was using uh, 43 kilobtus per square foot per year, I think. Uh, they've actually reduced the energy use um, as they uh, you know, learn to use the systems and, and so forth, uh, so that last year they're getting very close to what our original energy model was. So um, buildings learn, and the people that operate the buildings learn uh, with them. So that's our, our fourth uh, case study. Uh, and I just want to uh, end uh, what we share with you just to say that we've done uh, 24 buildings in the last 10 years, they're all different. The energy systems are different. The um, renewable energy systems are different. But the architecture is different also. And so every uh, program, every user is looking for something that best meets their needs. That goes for architecture as well as systems. And here you just see um, an array of different projects. They're all, they, they share the fact that they're all high performance, uh, low energy users, but they are uh, brick and, and glass, uh, they're wood shingled, uh, they're white uh, uh, metal, 
in the case of Stonyfield Farm, where that was, you know, sort of what they were trying uh, to show, a very clean uh, environment. Uh, and they're historic looking in some cases, like the, uh, the project uh, in the, on the right in the middle for Noble and Greeno School. So um, that's, that's what we brought to share. Uh,